Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Alex Elliott, and I'm the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department at California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university located in San Francisco. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight to Who is Wellness For? As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we, CIIS Public Programs, must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional, unceded Ramaytush Ohlone lands. If you're interested in learning more about Native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Faria Roshin and Targal Mezba, and then we will get right to their conversation. Targal Mezba was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, and immigrated to the United States with her family during the Iran-Iraq War. Targal's research connects to the everyday creative possibilities of living, loving, and dying during wars and their aftermaths. The Zapatista movement's political theory and practice of building autonomous communities in defense of Mother Earth and to create a world in which many worlds fit orient her work. She teaches critical theory, media studies, and other anti-colonial practices in the Anthropology and Social Change Graduate Program here at CIS, and experiments in co-creating collaborative spaces of learning and translation in and outside the university. Varia Roshin is a multidisciplinary artist born in Ontario, Canada. She was raised in Sydney, Australia, and is based in Los Angeles, California. As a Muslim queer Bangladeshi, she is interested in the margins, liminality, otherness, and the mercurial nature of being. Her work has pioneered a refreshing and renewed conversation about wellness, contemporary Islam, and queer identities, and has been featured in the New York Times, Al Jazeera, The Guardian, and Vogue. She is the author of the poetry collection, How to Cure a Ghost, as well as the novel, Like a Bird. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Targal and Faria. Hi, good evening. Thank you, Alex. Hi, Faria. It's um, nice to be here with you. A welcome, welcome everyone. And um, I'm super excited to talk about this really, really powerful book, your latest book, Who is Wellness For? and um, just wanted to invite you to uh, do a reading, to start it us off with a reading from your book, um, to set the tone for us to get a sense of your beautiful prose, your powerful prose, and then to sort of initiate the conversation between us. But first, let me know how you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I wanted to say that you are whatever. <laughs> hey, when I read it, I was like, damn, this is a great bio, and it's our <laughs> very alive. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I, uh, um, I have a little deal to do this. So, um, yeah, and it's really witchy to do the work. So it's like, it's like this like weird portal that I'm in that I'm like, can you see it? Um, <laughs> so would you like to start off with reading some? Yeah, but you didn't say how you are. Oh, I didn't say how I was, sorry. You know, I am having a tiny bit of um, issue hearing you a little bit, you come in and out. I'm, I'm doing as well as can be, thank you. Um, I find myself in a challenging uh, situation in my life, but I'm super well resourced. I mean, not, um, I think everybody is having a challenging life right now at the moment. I can't imagine we're not personally and globally, um, but I feel really lucky um, to be in uh, connected to communities who work in defense of land and territories and creating a different world from the one in which we're currently living in. So I'm actually doing really well in that context. <laughs> so thank you for asking. 
Can you hear me now or should I change my audio? Well, I hear you, but it drops a little bit. And I'm not sure if it's just for me because we might be on a different sort of network than what's actually being um, uh, live streamed. So I don't want to um, mess up other folks's ability to hear you. Let's let's go for a little bit and see what happens. Okay. Can other people hear me? <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read from my book, or um, I'm going to read the introduction to radical self care chapter nine. I really love this chapter. One of the best guides is to give ourselves the love we're often giving ourselves this evening. Though I've written, though I've been writing about self-care, professionally for about seven years now. Specifically, specifically pending, sorry. I'm stopping just in case we're having technical issues. Are we having technical issues? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is this any better? Tuggle? Yeah, that is. Okay. Okay. I think I think I figured it out, hopefully. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start again. I'm going to be reading Introduction to Radical Self-Care. One of the best guides to how to be self-loving is to give ourselves the love we are often dreaming about receiving from others. Bell Hooks. Though I've been writing about self-care professionally for about seven years now, diligently, methodically tending to it like a spiritual study. At times I have felt I know nothing about how to truly care for myself. Initially I turned to the concept of self-care for answers and found the work of the late great bell hooks and the tender radicality of Audrey Lord. I too craved an anecdote to better understand who I was and I longed to know how to aid myself in order to become that person. I knew that the reservoir of unresolved anger rooted in me like a deep prickly weed made it hard to know how to love myself. And so I assumed rightly the first step toward my higher evolved state was to learn myself intimately and to accept it all. I had to understand myself like a lover and to appreciate everything I felt was unlovable, gaining a security I had never known in myself. And according to Hooks and Lord, there is an inherent radicality to caring for yourself when you come from a lineage of oppressed peoples. Taking on self-care as an active embrace has meant merging the needs of my mind and body because in the act of self-care, the mind and body are prioritized. That is the very self you are caring for. Nothing that I share is a one size fits all theory, but instead something I've gleaned from my personal studies. I have often felt like self-care should come with instructions because I didn't quite know where to begin the process myself. The nature of self-care's commodification has meant that we've lost track of how personal this journey is. We all have our own traumas, fears, needs, and therefore our own specifications. 
idiosyncrasies. With such an overwhelm of choice, it can be difficult to know what we need as individuals, how to care for your own damn self. Capitalism has destroyed our sensors and instead we want it all or much of it without understanding what is inherent or honest to ourselves. We take direction from websites, peer reviews and best ofs to determine the scope of what we like. This is of course, those of, those of us who have the luxury to afford and fathom caring for ourselves. Why does wealth, real or imagined, inherited or self-made, make us believe in our own entitlement? In the 2015 New York Times article, The Price of Nails, Sarah Maslin Nur spoke to the labor condition of, conditions of nail salon workers across the boroughs of New York. Nail salons are governed by their own rituals and mores, a hidden world behind the glass exteriors and cute corner shops. In it, a rigid racial ethnic caste system reigns in modern day New York City, dictating not only pay, but also how workers are treated. This is how they're treated internally. Then there's dealing with actual customers. I remember feeling immensely grateful for this piece when it was published as I had witnessed my own eyes enough women, always white women, bullying nail salon workers in a variety of different scenarios to realize that there was a context of entitlement of who gets to self-care that wasn't being acknowledged. So much of the rallying cry of white supremacy happens in these moments of ubiqui ubiquity when even the most virulent acts of entitlement are ignored because we expect it of whiteness. I can't write about self-care without first pointing toward the obvious. Your care cannot impede on the care of others. Just like the concept of freedom, ask yourself, is it really freedom if it is only for some? If we prioritize not just what we think we deserve, but also how we are in relation to others. And that's how we care for them as well. We might experience true liberation. Being unbound by fear or hurt or pain simply by showing up as the best version of who we are sounds like liberatory behavior. Why has whiteness made the playing field so dirty with such high stakes and yet such low standards? Why isn't the measure of a successful society how well we care for each other? And how can we possibly believe that programming people to think only for themselves could result in holistically positive results? I think of all these years, I struggled with true unadulterated self-care because I was taking direction from others, expecting them to have solutions that I could have re easily just learned my, by myself for myself, but I believed that I would be cured by another's expertise. When that failed me too many times, I began to realize that I could find the right acupuncturist for me, the therapist for me, and that I could build my own routine around my life and my needs. Agency is an important and necessary part of self-care because in the process of learning that you have it, you are forced to take ownership over your life. Caring for yourself means taking a giant leap toward yourself. You have to put yourself in your own driver's seat. I did not know what life force was until my first Ayurvedic doctor, Pratima Rachor, an absolute renegade of Ayurveda in America, introduced the term to me, explaining it through the use of sun, the Sanskrit word prana, which means life force, to explain ownership of oneself. Mine, she, she explained, was low and dull, which was evident in the hue of my skin's tonality. I was yellow, but if I was more balanced, I'd be red. And the dryness of my body and hair, details like eczema that were dismissed by medical experts were to her important clues about my constitution. My dryness was an indicator of my incapacity to absorb nutrients, even good ones, an apt metaphor. It suggested 
I had an excess of fire, meaning I had to focus on cooling my body, which meant doing less vigorous exercise and embracing an overall slowness, including reducing caffeine intake. As she told me this, I protested, almost resentful. I can't do that, I told her point blank. Her advice, like a lost grandma's ardent wisdom, was blunt. If I wanted to truly heal, she told me, I'd have to start registering that my body had answers. The markings were telling her what she needed to know. Prana, she told me, is also about will. Will is an interesting concept because clearly I have it. I escaped my life and built what I have on my own, yet on a fundamental day-to-day -day level, I felt so broken, so, so unchosen, that the IBS ravaged. Everything was a representation of my mother's lovelessness and abuse, and any relationship could become a re-articulation of it. In Chinese medicine, Jing is known as essence. Another interpretation might be prana and it is passed from parent to child. Prenatal Jing nourishes the fetus during pregnancy and determines basic constitution, strength and vitality that is stored in the kidneys. One way to know if you have a weak Jing is to examine and know the state of your kidneys. The last time I was alerted to take note to take notice of my life force was during an ayahuasca ceremony, ceremony just before the pandemic. At the time, a teacher I was working with explained that my life force had been hijacked in such a rudimentary stage that, that to think that I could be in control was a new paradigm for me. But we all perform safety, don't we? Especially in ourselves. We think we understand who we are, and yet everything we know has been informed by others on some foundational level in ways we can't even comprehend. I had to notice that I had tied my own hands, or rather, that I had the keys to my own escape, simply by acknowledging the truths that I had never uttered. Facing the reality of how I participated in my own life's rhetoric, I used to accept that most people didn't really understand me because they couldn't see the psychological and emotional ravaging, but that didn't mean it wasn't there. I needed to learn how to validate it in myself. I think I'm gonna stop there. Oh yeah, we have to unmute you. Okay, I, I, I unmuted myself. <laughs> I can do that much. Um, thank you so much. And what a rich passage. You have um, all the elements that make this book so um, compelling for me are woven into this the, these pages that you read. And um, I think one of the first things I want to share is the way you are able to use your own personal experience to sort of work within this genre of a memoir, perhaps, but to then push it to a level that also engages with systematic analysis or analysis of systems. And, and so to be able to connect your experience to these larger systems and structures that are affecting everybody, right? Um, specifically in terms of obviously these systems of oppression that you get into, uh, colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, um, but, but to come at it from a very courageous and personal um, narrative that's not, um, that does both, right? That's not solipsistic, that it's not about sort of you know, just being quote unquote self-involved, um, but that has such a um, deep connection to the experience of life under capitalism for all, essentially. And like, I find this to be really powerful and not an easy thing to do for writers. <laughs> um, I think that one of the 
But well, one of the things I wanted to ask you is sort of for you to talk a little bit about your trajectory as a writer, because you start your first um, publication was a book of poetry. And that's something that I see in your writing here, the ability to convey more than one meaning at, at once, you know, to hold complexity and multiplicity. It's, a, it's something that a poem does, like it's, it's, um, that's, it's, it's the form that does it so well. So I was curious if you could talk a little bit, just also as a way of introduction, perhaps more to your own personal history. You started, uh, your first publication was a book of poetry and then a novel, and this is the third uh, publication that is in nonfiction format. So maybe if you could speak a little bit about that trajectory. Um, so I've been writing online for a long time. Um, I've been writing online for about 10 years and I started writing, I mean, I, I started like a bird, my novel when I was 12. So I've been working on it for a long time. And then when I was in school, I was really invested in social justice. I was a really, really, really committed kid. And, you know, I was going to detention centers and, and talking to it. Um, I grew up in Australia, so there was a lot of refugee um, crisis, like just a lot of in the 90s and the 2000s, just a lot of um, focus on refugees. Um, you know, there was like many different wars that happened during that time. And um, Australia just has an abhorrent relationship with refugees. And so um, I was doing a lot of, uh, just organizing and I, I talk about this a lot in the book. I come from, you know, this pretty intense heritage and lineage of socialist Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, um, perspective from the global South. So I have this like very intense uh, father and parenting on one hand um, that I think really helped shape my political languaging very young. Um, everything that I write about is like things that I was taught as a child. So it's really um, beautiful to sort of, this is the first work, Who's Wellness For is the first work where it felt very cohesive um, where I was um, able to kind of like create that linear linearity between like my childhood and, and sort of the evolution of, of who I am. But I, I began writing, um, so outside of the novel, I began like professionally writing as a film critic. So I've had many different lives. Um, and I worked as a film critic for many years. My, one of my first loves is film. Um, and so I think that that has a lot to do with my abuse and my trauma. I think I like, like, I like, you know, I think I, I experienced my totality and reality in, in, in like very extreme situations, you know, and like, that was so much of like how I was raised. So I like, like cinema, I, I like understand cinema. Um, so that when, and then, but like, you know, I started writing film criticism and was writing about like race in the early 2010s and was essentially being um, kind of erased in, because of the how white supremacist, frankly, most publications are, <laughs> and especially back then. Um, so I was being silenced a lot of the time. Editors were telling me like, can you not make this about race? Can you not make this movie about race? You know, like it's not always like a void of something. and. I think that sort of, that pressure, I, when I started to see society shift, I kind of felt like I was ready to shift into a different paradigm of writing. I don't think I was being taken seriously as a culture writer, as a film writer, um, and I was being silenced. So I was like, fuck this. Um, so I started um, focusing on like, what would the reality of books look like for me? Again, you know, I had, I had, been writing like a bird for for such a long time so I knew that that there was like one thing that I definitely wanted to publish 
And then How to Cure a Ghost, I think, came to me during to like during the years of 2014 to about 2017. I think I finished it around 2017, 18, really. Um, and those years were really rough for me psychologically and poetry became a channel um, of truth. And uh, I think that like the place where I could say everything I needed to say about myself and begin to untether myself from my childhood and sort of see more objectively what I had been through. But um, yeah, How to Cure, I sold How to Cure a Ghost and Like a Bird at once. And then they came out one year after another. Um, and now I'm here. It's very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> It is very exciting. Um, <laughs> I think well, you you have um, you know you, there's there's such a range of scholarship and experiences that you bring to weave you weave in to this book, and um, I think you really make a lot of um, otherwise inaccessible material accessible in a very useful way uh, yeah. to a, a wider audience. I think that's really important work of translation, like cultural translation. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think it, I'm very curious also to see how this really much needed critique of the wellness industry um, and its sort of fetishization of sort of individual, sort of the neoliberal individual, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, is, um, completely cut off from uh, the larger context um, and histories that inform illnesses and also their medicine. Mm -hmm. um, what the, the, one of the central arguments that you make is about this paradox of how the sort of colonial and capitalist systems that do create the conditions of harm um, and displace people and harm them um, are also the same. It's the same system that um, appropriates medicine from those very cultures and repackages it and makes it available for uh, you know a price to people in the West who can afford it. And um, that's a, one of the central contradictions of the book. Um, and I and there are many others actually that I find really compelling also that I'd like us to talk about. But I wonder how um, specifically in relationship to your own experience, how you came up against that in your own life, that that um, in the context of being South Asian, queer, Muslim, South Asian, um, living in different places in Australia and then the US. You mean the contradiction or? Um... Yeah, the contra like like how you came up against this appropriate like your critique how the critique of the wellness industry sort of sprang up from your own very oh, concrete okay. experiences, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, I think that um, like having the reflection of my parents and seeing beginning to really fully understand how how much they had been denied, like how ruthless their um, and imposing colonizing colonization was to them and how that was very much, I mean, it took me a very long time to figure this out, but it, it that was very much impeding on how they could be parents to me and good good parents you know I didn't receive good parenting unfortunately I had a very inspiring situation for many different reasons and obviously a very tumultuous situation but I wasn't given sort of the formative um, foundation and I think that's when I started to see the holes and cracks and because I was so invested in justice at from a very young age and had um I had a father and had a lineage that supported sort of the importance of revolution. 
I've never, I've never questioned um, my responsibility and I've never, uh, that's not true. I have questioned my responsibility, but I guess I like feel, um, I feel like all of this sort of analysis and synthesization and really sort of the life that I was given both of like having the father, like I did, um, who was like very learner and political. And um, I think this is the most important part of my dad. He like, he, he was willing to fight for justice. And I think seeing that uh, across my family and seeing how like, there are people that are willing to speak up, really encourage me to do the same. And then I also had the mother motherhood that I had and, and the extreme um, violence that I experienced under her hands. So I think all of it was really, really useful. That's a weird word to use, but it is. it was very useful for me to start to be like, okay, why is it that like yoga, when I, go, I started practicing yoga at 13 in Australia, going to a yoga class, seeing no brown people there, seeing no other South Asian person there. I can't, I don't even remember how many times I've probably seen a South Asian person in a yoga class over the last almost, oh no. Sorry, <laughs> that was wild. I was like, we really got prepped for all of the like, <laughs> um, all of the difficulties. Sorry, everyone. I was getting an incoming FaceTime call, <laughs> video FaceTime call. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, About yoga, when you started doing yoga, yoga and yeah. yeah. And I got like, yeah, I got, um, I got, uh, I think just the awareness and like this sort of like ripeness of anger and frustration. But even then I didn't obviously know how to talk about white supremacy, like the, that like white supremacy was the core issue. I was just sort of like, okay, like, I guess like this isn't affordable to other South Asians. I don't know. Um, and of course, yeah, that was almost, 20 years, so I started yoga almost 20 years ago. So I've been having this like real life analysis, like taking it in and observing for almost 20 years. So it's not like, you know, just like, and any, I think South Asian person can tell you the sort of isolation and sadness that you feel when you first start to encounter that. And you're like, hang on a second. Why is it that, you know, Indians themselves, South Asians themselves can't actually afford this, necessary tool for healing. Um, so I think a lot of things in my life kind of led me down this path and gave me the specification of why I needed to write this book. I think I definitely feel like this, I gathered all of the, all of the knowledge and um, life experience and transmuted it into the page, onto the page. I think one of my favorite lines is, I'm really good at making magic out of shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really, you are. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things to say to people, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah the sort of the observation around yoga and also meditation, like meditation culture and how that's co-opted and used as a way to well just how it's corporatized you know mm -hmm. like like um i think the the contradiction of yes you can use meditation and mindfulness um to ease the harm that this system is inflicting upon you every day so that you can continue to work for the system <laughs> that is reproducing this in your everyday life and it's actually not even that is not accessible to everybody. So those contradictions come through really strongly in your book. And I don't know how much you feel like talking about this at this moment, but you you address the really complex history of yoga that I just was 
stunned to read. Um, and the just the really interesting approach of inviting us to look at the complex histories of the worlds that we inhabit, you know? And yeah, I don't know if you feel like speaking to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, nobody talks about caste supremacy when they talk about India. And like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like nobody was like, oh, right. Um, literally like this esteemed caste is the ca Brahmins are the priests and, and the most religious, um, you know, venerated people close to God, Brahma. And obviously the idea of Brahman is, is a very integral part of Hinduism. And, um, you know, I have so much love for Hinduism and uh, obviously it, and I hope that it comes out on the page, you know, just like how much respect I have for the faith and, and, and the construction of that faith and like what that identity has how, has helped and supported and um, like reflected India back into itself, you know, like Hinduism is so synonymous with India. And yet it's also not, you know, there's so many different um, faiths and there's so many different people, there's so many different um, realities of being an Indian. Um, so now, of course, like India, if, 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 we, if we don't know, and I talk about this in several different places in the book, it's being sort of run by a, a, the fascistic right, the BJP party, and they are, you know, very, very anti-Muslim, they're very anti-Dalit, the, the, um, the, the lowest caste, known as the lowest caste, which was formerly called the untouchables. So um, in relation to other, 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 you know, identities, there is sort of this like very like, um, one identity of India that's being bred. And Narendra Modi, who is the prime minister of India has also co-opted a lot of the wellness and, and also yoga. Like he's a huge proponent of yoga and, and keeping it sort of like, and, and allowing like the West to acknowledge that it's an Indian art form. Um, so there's even in the rhetoric of, of the, the current state of India, there's like so much um, desire to kind of um, remind people that it's, it's um, not even remind people, to like sort of deny the totality of what yoga is and what it has been and the caste politics that unfortunately do temper and color so much of what comes out of India, meditation included. And But meditation is interesting because Buddhism was anti-casteist. And so Buddhism was a response, much like Islam was too, um, later in India, but Buddhism was very much, you know, created and Buddha was very openly anti-caste. Um, he was an Indian man <laughs> um, and he really sort of denied um, that and denied uh, that like, you know, that there can be like um, a hierarchy to enlightenment. And I think that's really sort of the integral part of uh, this conversation that I bring up in the book and what I really encourage other people to think about. I mean, we have to, when we understand context, we have to understand the entire context because I think that's the responsibility that we owe each other in our cultures and especially the cultures that have been demolished by colonization. There is a responsibility. And, and I say this for myself as well, I need to get better at this too. I'm not like the be all end all expert of everything. So I get it that it's, um, it's, uh, it's an evolution even in and of itself, you know, you're constantly learning. Um, but it's just something that I think that we need to talk about and address at the very least, just the ways in which fascism unfortunately does really also um, like wield itself with like wellness and health and how like that's, we're seeing that 
as well, like the sort of co-opting of like, what does it mean to be like perfect? Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to say. Thank you so much. There is, and you have, you, you gave a lovely summary and there's more in the book um, on the topic, but I think that you, you, you made the connections really well for us right now. Um, I want to slightly shift um, to talk a little bit more about um, the, this, this idea of healing or wellness in general and the relationship to healing traumas and um, one might even say our responsibility um, to, to heal. <laughs> and there's a, um, there's a lot in there that I want to unpack. But the first thing is I, I want to make sure that I address the way you define, at least in the book, in um, the ways that I've read it, um, the idea of healing and wellness as a process um, not as something that, you know, a fixed thing that, that you arrive at and you're healed, but as, as a journey. Um, and there's a little passage on 153 that I wanted to um, quickly read, if that's okay, or if you want to read yeah. it. No, no, it's, please read it. Um, it says, in my life, healing has been about integrating the fragments of mind, body, and spirit that were shattered by trauma. As I nurtured and braided all these disparate parts of myself together, a more honest version of me began to form. The more I thought about this on a micro level as an individual, the more I began to see a parallel between the earth and humans. If I could heal myself, and what I mean by this is largely about acceptance. It's healing to accept a failing body and tell that body, I love you unconditionally. Maybe we would have more proof for a way to collectively heal the earth too, because the earth, like our own bodies, needs so much love, nurturance, and gentleness from us. So beautiful. Um, I, I really appreciate this path this passage specifically for just reminding again what you mean by healing because it can be so i mean i personally used to be really resistant to the very nomenclature of healing right just the even the vocabulary because for me um it it represented um a denial of the the conditions that cause harm. It's like, how can you heal if the system that's causing harm is continuing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it can only be temporary and for some. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the beauty of language is that words have multiple meanings and ideas um, move through. Sorry for the sirens. <laughs> um, I'll mute myself for a second. <laughs> I think it's disappearing. It's actually one of my favorite um, cultural theorists, Stuart Hall, used to say, um, you know, language and meaning is always fluid. It's always power that wants to mm -hmm. fix um, mm -hmm. the meaning, right? Yes, Stuart, uh, I can go <laughs> off. Yes. <laughs> so, so I just, I love, I love that just the very um, activity of reclaiming terms, redefining terms and ideas and concepts and activating and motivating them in a different direction, I think is really powerful. And I also see, and, and, and this passage also that connects, you connect uh, the healing to our relationship to Mother Earth. And that's sort of where, there's, there's a place in the book where you say, I forget where it is, but you say something like, well, we we have to change everything. <laughs> we mm -hmm. need to reset it all, right? Mm -hmm. And and um and you know, for me that that was that was that's how I think about um different uh land rematriation projects 
um, mm. like you mentioned Sigorite, which is actually located in that's that's in where mm -hmm. I live in the Bay Area or Wichin, which is the uh, term for Oakland in the Chochenya language of the mm -hmm. Lishan um, peoples, the Ohlone peoples, the Lishan Ohlone people. Um, and Sogorete is a, a urban indigenous women-led um, land trust organization that's involved in uh, different rematriation projects. And, and this idea of rematriating the land, um, you know, is, is not so much a um, this idea of shifting ownership, <laughs> but it shifts our idea of ownership because nobody owns the earth. Um, but but that um, is an invitation to engage in a very different relation in, in a relationship with the earth and all its beings, right? And this reciprocal, elemental, relational. Um, set of ideas um, is something that you also animate, you know, in your work and how you connect this idea of healing yourself from trauma, um, traumatic experiences, and in your definition of healing, and the ongoing journey of that work is necessarily tied to this wider, um, you know, interconnection. Mm -hmm. um, to others, to everybody, wellness, I mean, that's your conclusion. It has to be for everybody if it's to be for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, that includes our earth, which is what gives us life every day. Yeah. That was a long comment and not a question in there. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's true. I agree with everything that you said. Yeah. Um, but I, I will, um, I, I want to sort of continue this to, to get back to this idea of the responsibility of healing from trauma. Um, it's where you talk about, I just have to bring my notes. Um, you, you talk about the, in how in Iroquois law, there is this idea of seven generations, and it's a foundation of a code for more responsibility to heal um, so that we don't reproduce abusive, uh, we don't reproduce the same lessons, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and this, I found this really, really compelling um, as a way to think about, as, as this part of this, different way of defining wellness and healing that is a responsibility for future generations, right? Because mm -hmm. what we, we also learn from you and your history with your mom is that she was also traumatized, right? And that there is this kind of cyclical process um, that, you know, we, we, we know more about it in the context of uh, the 1971 war, uh, we get some glimpses. There's not, you don't go too much into it, but it's there, right? This idea that there is a, uh, you know, like a generational process. Um, and, and, you know, and to think that in so many different contexts, quote unquote, perpetrators, and victims, and I say quote unquote, not because I don't think there are perpetrators and victims, I just think that they are the perpetrators and victims and other things also. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. But that, uh, but that there's that usually folks who cause harm were harmed themselves at some point, right. And so if we push that logic through, we understand the responsibility and the importance of needing to heal from those um, experiences, right? So I would love to um, hear a little bit more from you about your relationship with sort of coming to terms with that very difficult, um, you know, realization that, and and perhaps liberating realization that the person who caused you harm was also harmed and sort of what that 
sort of understanding that is probably something that you probably come to again and again, I imagine. It's not a static position, right? Yeah. Some of the experience of that for you and strategies for you to move through that experience. What are some of the strategies or? Yeah. Um, I, <clears throat> I am an abolitionist and that has really changed my life because um, I was already thinking about this sort of, you know, in 2018, I wrote an essay about MIA, the rapper, and uh, it was an essay called In the Defense of Nuance. And the whole article sort of grappled with what do we do with people, especially in the public eye, that fail us and are just inevitably gonna be messy and do things that are harmful and they're gonna harm people. It's just the sort of natural reality of us as humans, we are messy. Um, Bio Akamalafe also talks about this a lot, sort of the kind of like chaos of the world you know and like how actually other spiritual ontologies outside of these very like specific kind of you know monotheistic ones don't make a lot of space for I mean and and one could argue that every sort of like you know I, I think Islam has this Christianity probably has this I think Judaism has this as well sort of conversations that talk about liminality but by and large the kind of like what we get taught the kind of like dogmatic version of these faiths um, denies us the reality of chaos. And um, my life was really chaotic. My mother, my mother abused me. My mother molested me. My mother harmed me. My mother tried to kill me. My mother tried to, you know, she's just, I, I, that's why I don't want to talk to her ever again. I have no interest in having a relationship. At the same time, I am working on forgiving her every day and loving her every day because I understand, maybe not every day, I don't, I don't really, figure, but you know, sometimes she's, sometimes she's really present and like, you know, for years I was really angry and it wasn't getting me anywhere. It didn't get me anywhere to be so rageful and also really like not even know what to do with the rage. I was just turning it on, turning it against myself, turning it inward. Um, so I think like when I realized that, you know, abolitionist practice, praxis and practice is all about understanding that chaos, understanding that humans are inherently messy. So what's next? What's the, what, how do we create spaces of transformative justice or spaces of true, um, um, true reflection and true rehabilitation? How do we create that for people that harm us and fail us? Because rapists are always going to exist in society, probably, sadly, you know, and like uh, they, there's always going to pe be people that are going to harm other people. You know, what my mom did is very inevitable, given her life. It, it was there was an inevitability attached to it. And I just happened to be the person that was harmed. And I think that I, for myself, for my ancestry, for this, the lineage of sexual abuse that I carry in my body and the, the lineage of sexual abuse that I carry just in my own life, um, that reality, that reality that no other woman or femme person in my life, in my family probably could have said or talked about, I get to end that with myself. I get to, and that goes back to the Iroquois law, you know, and the idea of seven generations. It is this concept of, of grappling with your humanity as a larger interconnected part of something that's greater and grander and um, a tapestry of, of, of people that you are energetically connected to 
that you have a responsibility to. And I think that is also what it comes back to responsibility. I think we want to like discard people and be like, well, it's your issue now. Good luck. And I think the criminal justice system here and, and the prison industrial complex here um, and the denial of like understanding the ways in which slavery is absolutely um, being uh, perpetuated in you know, the prison system and the ways in which that dehumanization needs to occur for there to be the status quo and the hierarchy that exists in the US where for the entire existence of this country, they've relied on stolen labor and stolen land. That is the reality of the United States of America that hasn't changed in the last 400 years. And so whether it's you're taking it gloat like from a, you know, um, an outpost, you know, if you're going into the Middle East and you're creating havoc in order for to get oil and resources, whether you're doing it that way or you're doing it actually to your own people in every way, shape or form the US is depleting other people and other um, resources for its own gain. And for me, that is, um, that's really, really important to talk about. I totally lost my train of thought, but I, I'm like, where, did I, where am I taking this again? What was your question again? Um, it doesn't matter, but you answered, you, it was a perfect answer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> No, you went, it went, you connected, you connected the responsibilities and yeah. Um, I think I'm, I'm seeing the time checks <laughs> in the chat. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about um, the degrowth movement that you talk about um, towards the end of the book before our lovely audience has um, an opportunity to ask their questions of you. I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the degrowth movement and how you came to it and that you've sort of been involved for over a year. Um, and I think at the time in New York, you had mentioned, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, well, I'm still a part of degrowth in New York City. Um, shout out, shout out to my comrades. Um, and we are a Marxist Leninist organization that is dedicated to essentially um, educating and investing in degrowing from capitalism. So what that means and how I explain that to people is generally about consumption, going back to just how you consume and why you consume it. So who do you shop, shop from? Who do you buy from um, and, and why? And, and looking at those spending habits, looking at how sort of you engage with need and want. Um, I think in the era of fast fashion, I, and I talk about this, and this is something that I'm gonna continue to talk about. I have, um, I like nice things, you know, and that, that's, I love beautiful objects. I'm very invested in my home. I like fashion. Um, and through time, I've really thought about, you know, the, rea the reality is because we are a trading peoples, you know, we have traded for a millennia. It's not capitalism's fault. Like it's not, you know, I think often people think about socialism and this is how I was very much taught as a kid too, but now I'm a, an adult and I have, I can make my own I ideas about things, but socialism or, you know, anti-capitalist rhetoric is not about like, don't consume, never have anything nice. You can't, you know, have nice things. It's essentially about consumption. How are you consuming? Where are you consuming from? And why are you consuming it? So if you're buying um, less and not buying from fast fashion, I think fast fashion is one of those things, you know, like Zara, like your Forever 21s, we really need to contend with it societally. Do, how much do we need fashion at this rate? It's not, nobody needs this, this many things. And the landfills in Ghana will tell you that there's enough clothes to go around. So um, yeah, thinking about the sort of ripple effects in how you um, buy and how you contend with your own um, uh, need 
essentially for things. And really, I think re-examining that, that core issue and that fun, foundational issue, especially I think people like me that grew up on the internet, there's so much access to so much. And I think even with the elite, you see this, like how much money is too much money? Why do we have billionaires? Why do people have yachts? Like all of that is like, sure, we can, we can, we, we can, we can say a lot. Yes, I want to, you know, a, a temple in the sky. Like, you know, we, we can want a lot of things, but do we need them? And I, I think that especially with regards to, um, you know, facing climate, when thinking about what the everyday individual can do, there has been such an emphasis from corporations to be like, well, it's the individual's responsibility. However, that's not the case. If a family is barely getting by, we can't think about how much, you know, petrol usage or like, you know, even a, like what, like they get to do whatever the fuck they want. Like it's, if you are barely get, getting by, you don't have a responsibility, I don't think. I mean, of course you do but collectively we all do, but it is really sort of, I think re-examining that, but who really, who, what is the cost here? If like 1% of the richest in the world are using 50% of what the poorest nations in the world consume, it's a consumption issue. So um, I'm really, you know, really trying to talk to rich people here and, and talk about like, why do you need money and why are you hoarding it? And uh, if we believe in utopic envisioning, which I very much am, re I am very much invested in, there is enough to go around. We know that there is enough to end poverty. Elon Musk knows that. There's like a lot of things that we could do. This idea that power corrupts absolutely, absolute power corrupts absolutely, is so boring and basic to me. And I'm not interested in that kind of human weakness anymore. I think that we are really looking at our last days on such a majestic and beautiful planet. And I really, really hope that, and I really don't actually think we have a choice that we begin to change rapidly. Um, and I think degrowth is really the solution. Thank you so much. I, yeah, the, the connection between um, tackling consumption at the level of the system and structure so that, that of an economy that's based on the idea of growth, like everything, like you know, the growing economy, that's like, if it's not growing 5%, there's something wrong, right? right? And this idea growth. Yeah. of not sort of having a different conception, like degrowth, as, 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 as the title is, um, as the name is. Because we and, can't keep growing where it's not sustainable. We actually, no. we're, we're hitting the point where we actually can continue to grow. Yeah. So I, and I don't think like the average American understands that like you, there's not like an exponential growth like the planet can't support us she actually can't support us she does yeah. she's showing us she can't support us so yeah. yeah exactly and I think that sort of your way of talking about degrowth in the book and also sort of um, the emphasis on organizing is so important because it's not about like individual consumer choice like today should i buy this or should i buy mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. which is what the corporate world wants you to think that right. you know you can that you can make life-changing decisions by what you buy um but that 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 but nonetheless choice and responsibility are there but at a collective level and in a way that we we need to work together right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we have to award yeah. one another really sort of to mm -hmm. keep each other in mind i think like understand that like also different people have different needs but it's really really engaging with the fact that like mutual aid if you have more you have a res bigger responsibility to give back yeah we can't just hoard millions of dollars anymore it's not what what are you going to do with billions of dollars in a planet that's burning it doesn't make any sense 
doesn't make any sense. No, it does not. I don't want us to stop, <laughs> but, but I'm um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna transition to mm -hmm. questions from the audience, and I could talk to you for thirty more days. Not. <laughs> um so yeah i will i will if that's okay with you i'll just read some of the questions yeah. that have come okay <clears throat> um anonymous attendee my first introduction into western white wellness was through oprah and eat pray love these examples made it so at the end of a wellness journey there's some type of prize how have you interacted with the romantic tropes surrounding wellness? That's a great question. Um, yeah, the romantic tropes, I like that. Um, you know, I think we all get seduced by market capitalism at a certain point. And then I think at, 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 after a little while, and this is a journey of acceptance, but I think I began to understand at a certain point in the last couple of years, maybe last year and a half, really, if I'm being honest. I honestly think also just like in the process of writing this book, I began to understand that this is a long journey. And, it, and this is like, that I'm not, I've arrived at a certain point in my process of being able to be like, yes, I'm going to shed and transmute and sublimate all of this knowledge into the book where I am thus far. But I have been uh, bestowed with such a ex intense healing journey that I think that, and that's what I kind of was saying in that IBS chapter, that section that yeah. you, acceptance, and the acceptance yeah. is that this is long. The acceptance is that I can arrive at some place and then I might have to figure it out again. You know, that like, especially with bodies, like bodies will fail you. We're fucking mortal, you know, like we're, and we're aging. And there is a beautiful acceptance and understanding the aging and shifting body, the dying body, you know, the body that has so much life. and has so much death at the same time. You know, I think that that's really extraordinary. So, um, you know, and I, I'm doing, I'm, I'm sort of beginning a lot of, and Targol, I think you do this too, like death work. And so death work really helps me um, see the entire process of life, the birth, life, death process. And that is very humbling for me personally. So I think I've just like rejigged the way that I look at healing. Um, and I think the really dang another dangerous part about wellness is that idea. Like you can be saved. You can just get do this one wellness retreat and you're, you're you know, like you are cured of, of all things. And actually that's not the point. And I say this in the meditation chapter, meditation was seen as a way to confront death to confront and understand and acknowledge that you are dying. Um, so yeah, you know, I think I've just sort of shifted my relationship and shifted my focus and it no longer feels like this, like, you know, Sisyphean task of like, oh my God, I'm more shit. Like I can't just live like a normal person. Um, yeah, I don't think like that anymore. In the book, you also engage some um, disability scholars and, and artists and thinkers um, and that also, I think, speak to this idea. So I would encourage folks to check out those passages, too. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Next question. So many wellness practices are appropriated and stolen from BIPOC. How many, uh, how can we honor the ancestry original sources of wellness and be ethical when purchasing and part and participating in wellness products and practices? Um, well, I write about it all in the book. 
read the book, I would say. I think that one might be the most helpful. I talk about all of it. And uh, I don't have like a short sort of neatly tied answer, um, but I, it's, it's, it's comprehensive. There's a lot of things that need to be, need to, to be integrated, I think, in, in most people's lives. Um, but a, a big step, I think, is just to, to be honest with yourself, to be intentional always. Thank you. Um, actually, before I read the next one, I just want to say that the the invitation to be honest is such a powerful aspect of this book for me. And the way you model it, the way you do it, it's really um, it's it's really important because it carry it helps. It helped, it helped me move through the really difficult sections of the book, you know, because it's, and yeah, powerfully difficult and rewardingly difficult, but difficult sections, which I'm very grateful for. Um, okay, who inspires you, be they writers, poets, fine artists, etc., on your own self-care journey? Um, I mean, obviously, Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde are so pivotal in my own understanding. Um, and they've really helped me with the languaging of self care, and also like, how important it is to to announce like how radical it is, especially when you come from oppressed peoples, it's like, such a profound awakening. Um, June Jordan um, is another one who uh, is another writer who's really helped. Um, Arundhati Roy, who I talk about, who I reference a lot in the book, um, she's really helped. Um, Arundhati Roy, Vandana Shiva, who's an, uh, who's an incredible writer and ecologist and also um, Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, I had one other name that I completely forgot. Um, but they've helped me a lot with understanding indigeneity. I mean, Vandana Shiva has helped me so much to understand the incredible flora of India as a greater, greater India that, you know, also includes Bangladesh and, and um, Pakistan and just like the biodiversity of these lands and the technicalities and the specificities and the importance of the seed. All of that has helped me understand how to care for myself more. Um, Bria, Bri Mayo Tawari, who's like, I think the most formative um, Ayurvedic teacher I had. Um, she is uh, an incredible writer and educator. Um, and her book, Path to Practice, was really, really, really important in my own understanding of my uh, acquiring my, my own Ayurvedic knowledge. So Ayurveda is very much like how I like live my life um, digestively. I, I eat Ayurvedically. Um, and that's how I kind of keep my own ecosystem um, balanced. But that's why I like someone like Vandana Shiva who writes so much about the seed, understanding the, the nutrients and the nurturants that our bodies need, like the biodiversity of the land, like that, again, sort of bringing it back and understanding that my body needs a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables that I need to, you know, avoid like ice cold water you know i don't you know i don't i don't drink things like that anymore you know not drinking caffeine not drinking that much alcohol um all of it's been so integral and understanding all of the layers i think has been really helpful of like you know you can understand your body sort of um with like within like the the acupun uh, acupuncture lens or you can understand your 
your gut through this sort of more holistic Ayurvedic lens. Um, you know, there's just so many layers and all of these philosophies around the world that help us examine ourselves more closely and holistically. And I think all of that literature has really helped me. I, I, I read so much, I read very voraciously. So I, I feel like all of that information that I've gained over, over the last like 20 years that I've been doing this research essentially um, has all really helped me take care of myself. Thank you, Fariha. I, I just also want to mention that you write about this notion of epistemicide in the book, which is this idea of the, um, based on the Sousa Santos's work, um, this idea of how um, Western colonial modernity also killed uh, knowledges and knowledge systems. And so you're also in this, you write about the process of recuperating knowledges and histories as a really important part of this practice. And I, that's also a really uh, important part of the larger argument in the book for folks who haven't read it yet. Um, okay, I'm curious to hear any comments on the intersection of wellness and COVID-19. Um, I think it's just white supremacy in action. Um, you know, a desire to not understand your community, to, to sort of, again, I think to go back, I talk about the clean living movement in the book. Um, that was sort of ushered by John Harvey Kellogg, who's the brother of the man who invented Kellogg cereal. Um, and he was a really huge um, uh, supporter of this clean living movement that encouraged, you know, like being um, in some cases celibate, in some cases um, like a, a practicing temperance, so not drinking. Um, like really, really like watching what you're eating. Um, and I just think that I'm actually writing about this right now. I'm writing about Kellogg and also um, there's this book called The Futurist Manifesto by this man named Marinetti. I can't remember his first name, um, but he was a poet um, and, and wrote this cookbook the, sorry, the, yeah, the Futurist Manifesto, which is a cookbook. Um, and in it, he sort of like is really challenging Italian society to stop eating pasta. Cause he's like, pasta is making everyone slow and whatever. And like, it's just like interesting how fascists like find a way to like control people. Anyway, that's all I have to say about that. I also, you know, it's, I think, I think, I don't know. I think if you're not thinking about other people's wellness and you're just thinking about your own and you're isolating yourself, not realizing that you owe your, 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 your life to the land that you live in and therefore you live on and therefore you owe your life to the people around you. It's that act of service is no longer there. Um, yeah, I hope those people read this book. Um, we have another question that asks, what are your self-care practices? I have a lot of self-care practices. Um, I, and, and I write about this a lot in the book because, you know, I talk about class and I talk about capitalism and obviously like, you know, I'm writing about my own experience and I'm talking about how frustrating it is that you need money to take care of yourself. But I am fortunate enough to be at a place where I can actually look after myself now monetarily. So I take myself to acupuncture every week. I, um, uh, I, I do physical therapy every twice, every two times a week. I do trauma therapy. Um, I do massage therapy both twice a week. Um, so those are my like outward things that I need. Um, that have really helped me with my chronic pain and my chronic illness. And then I eat Ayurvedically, which is really important for me. So, cause it keeps my IBS um, level 
and uh, it really helps me uh, just with my general health and well-being. Um, but yeah, I think like really controlling what I eat, really ensuring what I'm putting in my body is like is is organic and and um, and natural, um, which I think is sadly a privilege in America. Um, and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be hard for people to afford um, healthy organic food. Um, and there's a reason why it's not accessible. Um, so I just, I try and, I try and just like be very diligent about how I'm feeding myself. And those things have been really, really helpful. And then on top of that, um, I sit with psychedelics a lot. I smoke a lot of weed. I have a good relationship with grandmother ayahuasca. It really helps me ground myself. I pray and meditate every day. Um, I really have to pray and meditate every day. Um, and I try and make sure that I have a very honest relationship with God um, every day. So I'm moving with that divine momentum. Um, yeah just grounding myself in the earth. Who do you wish to read this book and what do you hope they take from it? Um, white rich people, for sure. I would love white rich people to read this book and be like, whoa, I can change so much. I can do so much um, and feel energized about that. Um, yeah, this book is really, really like, I'm really trying to get it to, to the people that are responsible. And then of course, like, I mean, that's one, that's one group of people. And then of course, like I want child sexual abuse survivors to read this book. I want people in prisons to read this book. I want people that have suffered intergenerational trauma to read this book. I want anybody that feels like they have something to heal to read this book. So I really wanted to get as far um, as I possibly can. I want this book to get into as many hands as that will have them. And I feel very grateful that, you know, that people read my work, but yes, any way that you can encourage others to read. Um, if you're watching, thank you so much. I, I need your support. So like, give it to everyone, talk about it. Um, thank you for having me here. It's just like, such a gift to share this work with people. Mm, this is our final question. And I think it's a nice one to end on, which is what is yeah. bringing you joy right now? What is bringing me joy right now? It's always the same, good food. Um, good life experiences, you know, like having beautiful connections with people. I mean, that's really it. Like I, I, I grew up in so much pain and I didn't really believe that I would ever be understood. And it's an extraordinary experience to be able to connect over my own work with other people because it really, I think like heals that, 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 baby fought that part of me that's still so broken and sad and um yeah but like life brings me a lot of joy like being with people having ha sharing food with people um sharing stories talking about magic talking about faith talking about you know the ways in which we can love Love brings me joy. Being able to express love to others, to feel love toward myself. Yeah, I'm lucky. I can find joy in a lot of the small moments. And I had to train myself to do that. But I do, I can access a lot of joy just from the like sounds of my life or like a song, you know, like when you're high and you put on the right song and you're just like, what the fuck? Like, it's just extraordinary. And so like, 
there's so much that brings me joy. Films, you know, movies, watching TV, watching good things, reading books, just like being, you know, just like reading a cover to cover and and uh, being in nature. Yeah, I, I've uh, one. La the last thing I will say is that. I live in this like beautiful little complex with four other people and we have this like very robust garden and um, I've been taking charge of watering the plants in the morning and I just, I don't know. It's, it's so beautiful to be able to just like be with the plants in the morning and like to go get an iced matcha afterwards and, and walk, you know, and listen to a song or listen to some songs. I make playlists. So like listening to songs, it's just, yeah, life is really magical. And um, it's really difficult and hard, but it's also really magical. And my name means joy, Fariha means joy, so in Arabic. And, you know, I think that the extraordinary thing about my life is that I survived it and that I was able to bring and alchemize all of the stuff that happened and bring joy to myself and to others. And that is like such an extraordinary gift. Thank you, Fariha. I hope that we can break bread together someday. <laughs> I, I hope so too. It I would really be really that. nice to cook together. Or for <laughs> me to cook for you, I would love to cook for you. <laughs> I would love that, please. <laughs> okay, let's do it. <laughs> and I will say maybe just one, I, there's so many things I, I, I want to touch on about the book more, but we don't have time. I encourage folks to read it. Um, it's a beautiful offering. And one of the things that you say, maybe I'll, I'll close us out with this, is it's actually in towards the beginning of the book. Um, I think it's through Saidiya Hartman's work that you talk about sort of how domination works through the policing of our imaginations, you know? And I just, um, I appreciate so much that reminder and, and, and this, again, another invitation for us to imagine, imagine the world we want, imagine the connections we need, imagine, <laughs> imagine the, um, the earth that's flourishing, that is not being um, desecrated by, you know, extractivist capitalism and greed and profit driven um, structures and systems and we um, we have each other yeah we do and that's an extraordinary thing worth our time and our energy to protect yeah. thank you thank you thank you so much I think we will bring Alex back on for her to close us out Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded this evening. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available here on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We will also be featuring this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thank you again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.